Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTE GA podcast. Uh, Mikey Stafford here. He's not supposed to be anymore, but I think Jackie and Roy are off at some symposium on Corkness or celebrating their under 20 hurling title or so. They're, they're not here anyway. So like Al Pacino and Godfather 3, just when I thought I was out, they, they pulled me back in. But I'm delighted to be here with uh, two fine football man, men, Niall McCoy of RT Online and Tomas O'Shea. How are you doing, lads? All good, Mikey. Mikey. Good stuff. Uh, Jesus, T- Tomas, the, uh, you must have been like a, a bullet going down the M7. Well, at 120 kilometers an hour at all times, obviously. <laughs> you were on the highlight show last night and you're here with us at a reasonable hour on a Monday morning. Fair play to you. Committed to the cause. Yeah, yeah, it was good to be back. It was good to be. I was up in Drone on, on Saturday evening and um, back in studio last night and nothing has changed. Jam packed and uh, it was great. Like, you know, you had 32 teams. Involved. I don't think we got that in last night. It was 32 teams involved in championship, sun yeah. shining. Uh, I don't think it's ever been done before, Mikey. And um, yeah, there was a lot to get through. Um, but you know, you had the show on a Saturday night as well. There's so much football. So yeah, good to be back. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's good to have you back. Um, and as you say, you've come back at a busy time of the year and it couldn't be much busier. You're kind of like, what games will we talk about? So, we can't talk about them all anyway, because we'd be here all day. It's the same problem that a- anybody has, uh, Niall. We will, Niall, of course, talk about uh, Tyrone and Armagh, because it would be remiss of us not to. Ah, you can leave that out if you want, don't worry. <laughs> no, 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 we won't. But I don't, where I wanted to start, though, was um, the issue of scoring difference, Tomas. I, I think this is obviously going to come into play, because there's some very tight groups. Um, and Group 3 is the one I look at most, because... Um, Roscommon on three points, Dublin on three points, Kildare on one point, Sligo on one point, and uh, we have uh, Dublin playing Sligo and Roscommon playing Kildare. Um, and the scoring difference, Roscommon are plus 10 points, Dublin are plus nine points, Kildare are minus nine points, and if you're good at maths, you know that Sligo are minus 10 points. So that can't be much tighter to Moss in terms of who goes straight to a quarterfinal and who goes into preliminaries and who's home and away for the... Uh, you know, Kildare and Sligo obviously in a battle there. So what makes me wonder is, do you, do you think managers and teams have had copped on to the fact that scoring difference could be crucial here? And I only say this because I watched the Dublin game and for years now, Dublin have been quite risk averse. And if there's a point to be fisted, why the hell would we go for a goal? And th- there was a great example towards the end, Tom Lahiff, who was a late sub, was put through. He was through on goal. He was literally him versus a Kildare keeper and he did what every Dublin forward does on that occasion he slapped the ball over the bar when the match was won I think they were 9, 10, 11 points up and I'm just thinking is this going to come back to bite a team on the arse because I think Ross, maybe Roscommon have twigged onto it um, but I'm not sure if Dublin have so if Roscommon do better against uh, Kildare than Dublin do against Sligo they're straight through to a quarter final and will Dublin be looking back saying maybe we didn't need all those fisted points against the team we were already beaten yeah, well, I suppose when you look at it, on paper, Roscommon probably have the tougher task playing Kildare. Dublin will play Sligo, but effectively, and the way I make it out, Mikey, is both Dublin and Roscommon need to win as by as much as they can to make it as uncomfortable as they possibly can for the other to top the group. And, you know, there is a huge... You're uh, topping the group. I think you saw it with Talton last night. You, you even the preliminary quarterfinals you get your home draw and it does make a difference here by topping the group, you're getting a week off. So the question you asked, do teams know, or are they trying to, to, to really hammer the hammer and get as many scores as they can possibly not. The fact that it's the first time, like, I don't know, some of the games are, are uh, flattish enough. I think teams are coming to terms with playing week in, week out. I don't think we're getting the performances we we think we are off teams, and I think teams are possibly struggling to come to terms with playing nearly every week or every second week. And for years, it's what we wanted. But certainly, goals for goals against um, are going to be huge in terms of who gets second and third place. Not only in Group Three, there's another couple of groups as well. Some are 
late on. I think there's only one team effectively out, and that's Clare. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot to play for in the last round. Uh, but this group, Group 3, Dublin, Roscommon, Kildare and Sligo, um, that's the big one really, you know. And Roscommon, Kildare, I think, will be a really interesting match because it's a game that Kildare could potentially, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. They're one of the most inconsistent teams in the country, but they could potentially rattle Roscommon as well. You, you know, it wouldn't be um, unthinkable. So, yeah, did Dublin, I'm not sure, Dublin are potentially, they're able to tag on scores. I don't think it would have uh, even carry, you know, there was teams at the weekend that you'd imagine were trying to 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 um, add to their scoring, I suppose, plus and minus. But, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not too sure teams are zoned into that at all. I think they're zoned into coming first, second, third. But I think that draw that Roscommon got against Dublin was the real, that rattled that that group as such. Yeah, it's, it's made it fascinating, Niall. And uh, Tomas makes an interesting point there about kind of, you know, we're getting more games, but maybe we're not getting the in, the intensity we're, we're expecting. But you know, that's to be expected. If teams are being asked to play more games where it's not do or die, you can't expect them to go hell for leather, you know, kind of like it's knockout football when it's not. And this might be kind of a, might be a product of this then that, you know, teams are trying to, when they know they're playing a division three or a division four team, perhaps, you know, and they're a division one team, they're doing enough to win. At, you know, they're not breaking themselves. And I'm not saying that to do down, say, Louth yesterday against Mayo or anything mm -hmm. like that and say that, you know, Mayo underperformed because they were trying to do as little as they had to. But at the same time, it might explain why kind of teams aren't kind of stepping on the throat of their opponents, you know, because they are trying to manage minutes. They're trying to kind of make sure that they're not flat by the time they get to the end of the group stage. So it's a balancing act, isn't it, between, you know, conserving a bit of energy and keeping something up your sleeve, but also making sure you do enough to finish where you want it in the table. Yeah, yeah. And in those sorts of matches, we've seen it, obviously, Sligo, Kildare, or Arma, Westmead, or, or Westmead, Galway for 15 minutes. When you are maybe just not at that top uh, range, it, it's hard to get out of that too when, when the opposition does sort of get a wee march on you. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. Um, I take on all the criticisms about too many games and all, but I, I, I think it's been fairly enjoyable for on the, on the most part. Um, I think the GA will be pretty happy with how competitive it's been, and that's I suppose that's the main mark. Um, you know, I think everyone complains about the amount of games to eliminate four teams, but we're going into the final round. We're going to be pretty much bereft of dead rubbers, uh, bar obviously cleared as Tomas said, are, are already exited. So I, I, I've sort of enjoyed it. The two matches, yes. Uh, I was talking to a few people last night and they weren't impressed with the Mayo Loud match. I think it was all right, to be honest with you. I thought Donegal, Darius played at a really good intensity too. Like it's, it's been good. As you see, it's not, it's not do or die. So you're never going to have that real knockout feel to it. But uh, I still, still think Mikey's been... I yeah, I think now everybody's talking, oh, and there was a good few points made online last night that people are voting with their feet. It's not do or die at the moment. It's yeah. not pure knockout. So I do think that that has a small effect on it. Um, and I hate going back to it. I think I don't mind the amount of games. We've been constantly saying it. I've constantly said it. Players want to play every two weeks. I know they're playing maybe by week now, and it is tough enough on them. But I don't think they'd have an issue with that. I do think that the big issue, and I'm sick of saying it, is you have a warm-up competition, you have a national, you have a provincial championship, you have a group stage, and then you have the All-Ireland Series all in six months. That's your issue. And yeah. you can you can come, and it's not, oh, we're suddenly giving out that there's too much games. It's not. We've a lot, lot more games, which is great. We've less time. You know, I, I think if you had until... Jeez, if you had this setup with September date, geez, you'd have a good setup. Yeah. You know? Even last year, like working on a sports desk, like it was it was done. And then you're like, right, what are we going to do for the rest of the summer in terms of yeah. county stuff? Like, and uh, you know, the club's fantastic, I love it, but it was just it was over in a flash last year. So I even you know, September, I don't think we're ever going to get back to that. You know, I don't think but they'll extend it some bit. They'll have to extend they'll have it. Some it some yeah, they'll have to, even another two or three weeks would make a hell yeah. of a difference there. Like, um, because the group stages are being pretty rushed through. It's three mm. weeks or three games in four weeks, and then you have your preliminary quarterfinals the next week, and then I think the quarterfinals are the week after, aren't they? So you're yeah. going to be, what five, five yeah, games in six weeks for the second and third place. Yeah, like that's 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 heavy going. It's heavy and, going. 
It's heavy going on the fans as well when it's it's twenty two sterling for an adult ticket and I presume about twenty five euro. Yeah, you pass that week in one week for a, a family. Like I'm not surprised that some people are saying, "Well, we'll wait until a preliminary quarter final or a quarter final," like because it's uh, it's you know I, I think it's a bit of a pricey uh, admission fee. I I think that's a fair point on the fans, but the the, the counter argument to the idea that it's it's all a bit squashed in Tomas not that I disagree with you the counter argument though uh was the team in in red and white yesterday above in Bally Buffet who scored 314 against the Donegal mm-hmm. team who were relatively impressive and um they may have changed managers but the fact hasn't changed the dairy have used about 15 and a half players this year you know and um, they um you know there was people who kind of thought after Roy Gallagher stepped away that thing you know there might be a bit of a wobble and then you know there was the draw with Monaghan who now look quite impressive as well. So maybe the, the draw with Monaghan is in a different light to Moss. But, you know, Derry scored three goals in the second half yesterday and looked looked damn impressive. You know, they, they seem to be, however they're doing it, as we've always joked about Rory Gallagher teams, which they no longer are, but they're fit. They're very fit. These boys are fit and they seem to be a team who, they're well built for this to Moss, I think. And they're, well, we get on to talking about uh, Niles, our man, a bit, who seemed to have kind of gone from being quite an attacking team to kind of regressing the other way. Derry seemed to be a- adding a couple of, you know, attacking bows to their to, to their string, you know, and they are, are they contenders, would you say, at this stage? They, they probably I were anyway, but they're more impressive. Or... Say they're contenders, Mikey, and I suppose I think after the Monaghan game, you know, with everything that's going back on in the background there with Rory Gallagher, I think after the Monaghan game, uh, naturally, the Armagh game was a huge, huge match, and it took an awful lot out of them. It was very difficult to come out then so soon after. And I think people were watching the Monaghan game, and you know, you're looking at Derry for the last year and a half, and they're trying to make this progression, and they are trying to to add to their bow in an attacking sense, which I think they have done. We saw that yesterday. But then after the Monaghan game, you were thinking, Cripes, is what's going on in the background rattling them? Is it an issue? They were not as energetic as they normally were. And then they come out, as you say, a week later, an absolute powerful performance. Donegal were actually brilliant. I enjoy that match. I think Donegal mm. were absolutely brilliant. I think um, they pressed on Derry's kickouts. I enjoyed it. But you could see the way Derry can. And they always spoke about the dubs, the way they come to terms with situations in mid-match. Uh, Donegal initially rattled them on it but they came into it and they actually won ball and they punished and they got a couple of scores up the other side on it uh, but they were very very impressive and towards the end of that game uh, Donegal had stayed on their coattails and at the very end the conditioning the driving the support play it was phenomenal their half back line kept on driving all day um, they were that very Connor Doherty they goal made the, yeah incredible. they made the holding on possession Mikey, they make the hand passes, everything is slick, everything was to hand. They looked as sharp. Um, right now, you'd say, like we had this discussion, and you like having this discussion, obviously there's an awful long way to go, but right now, who would you pick? Who would you pick? And everybody seems to be going for Galway. But I tell you right now, Derry would not fear anybody in the country. Um, and the way they're playing, yes, of course, they have to be regarded as as title contenders. But the big thing for Derry and the big thing for, for other teams, there's only three or four teams that can actually put up their hand and say that there isn't a question mark about them actually having the quality to win it because they have won it and they have that experience. And you're talking Kerry, you're talking Dublin, you're talking Tyrone, there's a question mark over Galway. Can they can they make that step up? Can Ross Common make a step up maybe on a smaller level? Can Derry make the big step up? And, you know, with the way they've shaped the team, with the little subtle changes they have, with the little fact that I suppose the spread of scores is that little bit more up front. Yeah, you'd say Derry are real title contenders. Uh, Niall, um, we've joked about this in the past. There's nothing nothing an Ulster team likes more than a bit of a siege mentality. And um, obviously we're not going into the hows and whys of Rory Gallagher's departure, but he's departed. And we could probably assume that not everybody in the camp is happy about that, and even if they understand it. So, like, in a way, there's kind of the perfect conditions here for kind of a dairy run, isn't there? Yeah, and, and uh, I, I thought uh, Connor Glass was on the site today saying he didn't think they were that good. I thought they were pretty outstanding. Pretty outstanding. I thought Donegal are very good. But the defensive turnovers, their timing in the tackle, the speed at the break, 
it, I, I thought it was a fantastic performance by Derry, one of their best performances of the season. And okay, they butchered a few goal chances, fair enough. But Donegal performed. They scored three. <laughs> they scored three. They probably could have had another two handy enough. Uh, John Patton made a couple of saves and, and different mm. things like that. I thought Donegal were very, very good, looked a whole lot better. But I, I generally think Derry were outstanding. outstanding. And in Conor McCluskey to have such a gem of a player who's getting better than last year. He was fantastic last year. He should have been in the run for an All-Star. Or if he had got an All-Star, it shouldn't have been a surprise. This year he looks even better. And it, it reminds me a wee bit, not the exact science of it, but Donegal 2011, you could see they just were missing something to take that next step. They addressed it. They added more to their attack and goal for 2012 and obviously got there. Derry had made those tactical changes to look a lot more fluid going forward than it did. Um, okay, you can still see maybe a reliance on McGuigan that may have come to pass yet, but they've identified an issue. They've worked extensively on it and they look a much better team for it. And just their physical conditioning and their strength and all, I, 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 uh, Tomas hit it there. I don't think there's any team that they feel they won't be able to beat on their day. Uh, they got a bit of a lesson last year against Galway, or just things didn't go for them. But uh, you put them up against Galway this year in Pro Park, and it's a completely different game. Like, um, I, I generally think that their team should be targeting Sam. Like, and I, I, it'll take a very good team to stop them. Yeah, but it's what you said there, Niall. And uh, yeah, they have that. You know, Doherty McFall is making a big difference up front. Yeah. But Jesus, the three goals they got. Two were scored by the two wing backs. McKinless was key in the third. You mentioned McCluskey. They are attacking and their fitness and the way they can actually defend so hard, get that structure into place, the conditioning they have. They don't mind pushing up enough on kickouts. They'll still slow the ball down. They'll still get back into position. But it's when every single time they counter attack, it's at pace. Yeah. Um, and possibly they will at some stage have to probably kick the ball a little bit more because teams will adapt to that running game as they go further along the line. But um it is, it, it's full of high octane. And I didn't that I was waiting. I was actually thinking, Christ, we're going to be having a conversation Sunday night about Derry, about the effect of Gallagher, mm -hmm. because they were flat enough against Monaghan. If they were flat yesterday, we'd be having a conversation about what's going on in Derry. Is it a big, um, it is a fact that, that Gallagher has gone now and they're a different team kind of a thing, and it's not. They, they mm -hmm. answered everything yesterday, and yeah, they are contenders. I, I think Oren Lynch, too, is a different player this year. Uh, in that last year, he was seen as a, I don't want to use the word liability, but teams felt that there was maybe a, an error in him or something in him that you could maybe get at. And he looks much more sort of rounded, much more experienced in the position now, much more confident, pushing much more aggressively on the kick out than he did last year. He's doing that on a consistent basis. And I think that confidence that Lynch has now given him, where last year there were still question marks over them, has given them an extra layer of confidence there moving forward. So, listen, mm -hmm. yeah, Monaghan energy sap, but they're, they're all, everything seems to be right back on track now. Tomas, uh, just quickly, I, I won't ask you to get out a whiteboard first here, Renton, but I'm curious, as you say, t teams will kind of start to counter Derry's running game. Briefly, how would you see about doing that? Are you trying to clog the middle a bit more, not sit back so deep, or kind of, you know, engage them further up the pitch, or what are you doing? Well, a lot of the teams, I suppose, Derry, when that ball initially breaks down, Mikey, above, you'd have to get pressure on that ball. And when the pressure is getting on the ball, you're organising yourself from another point of, of view. But it's easier said than done. A lot of the time, and a lot of the teams, and Derry are one of the teams that do it, they would commit bodies inside the 13-yard line. Uh, Donegal did it a few times yesterday. So if you have bodies, the idea initially by Donegal was Donegal used to always attack, but they'd always have four or five bodies out around the middle of the field that in case that that the ball broke down they had that initial cover and then they would allow whatever forwards they had inside to track and harry and, and tackle Kerry won in 2014 against Donegal by holding their half back line in position to having the, their midfield in position basically and to allow the six forwards to attack but the question now and it has involved, uh, evolved so much and goalies are coming up by certain teams you'll probably need more than six or seven forwards to break down the opposition and the key area I would say in breaking Donegal down would be initially to turn them back turn the back put heat on that ball wherever it is 
But the, the, if you're trying to track McCluskey, McGrogan, Darty, Rogers, they have to be tagged. They're their strong men. They're their runners. Um, you have Eaton Darty back there. You'd have McFall back there. Sometimes you even see Mc, Mc, or McGuigan back there. It's the, it's tracking their runners, basically, Mikey. It would be the, the most difficult thing. You can have a layer of cover outside, but the layer of cover outside will not track the runners. They'll just pop it over your head. Mm. The runners, the key is one, pressure on the ball, two, tracking the runners that are going to make those bursts, and three, maybe having a, a third layer outside to track them. It's, it's all about turning them back. If you turn them back once and twice, yeah. that's it. Then you can get back set. But the difficulty with Derry is teams and Donegal, I suppose, it wasn't really until the last quarter that Derry really put on the burners on them. I think Donegal tired. I think we have to take into account, yes, Donegal did have a, second, a good second half by Clare. And yes, they have improved so much, but they've had a poor season up to now as well. Um, but it's no easy. Like I guarantee you the high condition t- teams like and every team, I, I'd argue right now, have made so much progress in that regard. But it won't be who 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 deal with Derry and that game better. The, the Galway as well, and um, the Dublin's, uh, yeah, um, Kerry. I see. I think Dublin and Kerry are struggling at the moment. I, I don't think they've found their mojo. I don't think they're playing mm. with the confidence that that could say. And even though they're favourites ahead of, of of Galway, Dublin and Kerry are ahead of any of those teams right now. I don't think Derry. Um, would fear Dublin or Kerry. But yeah, stopping that, you would have to, to slow the ball down at source. You would have to track runners and you would have to have cover outside. So you're you're playing six wing backs and your forwards basically. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I think I think the role and people say say to me often, would you like to be playing in that shite right now? And I say I, I think as a wing back, look at Connor McCarthy with Monaghan. I think it's wing absolutely... back's the best position on the pitch now if you're fit. Modern player and you can have wing forwards who you change back into a wing back. Charlie Oak Burns is an attacking player. They're the guys who get you up the pitch. You have wing forwards who are wing backs and wing backs who are wing forwards all the time. And it's the modern game and it's probably the most enjoyable position on the pitch at the moment because you are that transition player. You're carrying ball at pace if you can. Yeah, a word on Mana and then Niall, just uh, before maybe we'll, we'll move back and talk about Saturday's games, which Tomas didn't talk about on the telly last night. And there's a few things to discuss there. Um, Monaghan, are, are, do we have to put an asterisk X for this now? Because Clare seemed to have just, Clare's season seems to have kind of folded in on itself. But Monaghan have kind of in, slowly kind of building and this new format allows them to maybe show the best of themselves outside the province of Ulster, which has always been the criticism of Monaghan, isn't it? That kind of the best of them was in the provincial championship and when they came into the All-Ireland series, that didn't quite happen for them. But um, maybe kind of a slow burn of a season is what they need. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be coming in all right under the radar. Um, uh, Corey Vinnings, obviously, he's, he's looked at his bench and he, he wants to have really experienced players coming out to close those tight matches and, and so far it's worked for him. Um, they got a real rattle from Clare. Uh, bit of a shootout, bit of a, maybe going back to what Tomasi and maybe one of those matches where the intensity and the space isn't what you'd expect in a real blood and thunder match, but uh, an enjoyable for all to see him. Um, Took a lot of confidence, obviously, out of Celtic Park. Uh, I, I think Monaghan would be really happy with how things are going. And having Jack McCarn rediscover his touch. Eight from the, play. Yeah, and Jack hasn't had, by his own admission, I'm sure, hasn't had his best season. He's an outstanding player. He's obviously had you no know, bit of stuff going on with having to move clubs and stuff. Has probably been possibly a distraction I don't know this season but he looked back to the Jack McCarn we knew there uh, on Saturday and or sorry at the weekend there and they've scores they've scores like you know McCarn McMahon is coming on late uh, Michal Bannigan I think is one of the most underrated players in Ulster like you know really enjoy watching him and they're just sort of I'd say they'd be happy just to travel under that radar for a few weeks yet Mikey like uh, they're they're true to the knockout stages you know uh where remains to be seen. The match with Donegal, they've got uh, a bit of a hex over Donegal. I think their record over the last 20 years is unbelievable against Donegal. So 
Listen, it's uh, it's another score difference issue, though. You can't see them beating difference. Donegal by more than Derry beat Clare, can you? Yes, and uh, even the Armagh group there as well, Mikey. If, if Westmead pull off a bit of spree against Tyrone and Galway, as expected, beat Armagh, and we're back to score difference for, for there as well. So there is a lot of there's a lot of what ifs in these in the, yeah. this last weekend. Okay, um, we'll leave Mayo, they've been discussed enough, and God knows they'll be discussed again. And they, as Kevin McStay says, they got the two points, they got the job done. And he kind of glasses over that final few minutes there where they almost didn't get the job done. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you, Tomas, about matters in Parky Cueve on um, on Saturday. Um, not not in any way convincing from Kerry. Um, and that would be, I suppose, for a lot of us, that's how we put it with Sagi. So Kerry weren't very convincing. Is that doing Cork a disservice? Did Cork really raise themselves for the old enemy? Or is there a bit of a slide from Kerry here? I think uh, you mentioned it already, Mikey. I think there is um, possibly um, a thing, I don't know what you'd call it, a kind of a, a belief out there that Kerry possibly don't like going to Parky Cueve. Um, it has been the one place, I suppose, uh, Cork have, have struggled so much going to Kerry in the last number of years. Um, going down to Cork, I think it was a huge game for Kerry because of the fact that that. Um, they struggled against Mayo, struggled badly against Mayo in particular areas of the pitch. You had midfield who struggled. They struggled on their own press. They got caught on the inside a good few times. They weren't really hungry. They weren't really uh, playing with that energy. They weren't putting heat on. Um, they were wide open at the back at times. And I think, you know, for a team like Kerry right now, who would have big ambitions and this drawn out kind of match after match and league kind of, of, of situation that you have now suits them. It, it's given them time to get organised. They are that they are good enough to kind of make it to the quarterfinals. They know they'll probably make it to the quarterfinals, but there are probably still issues there, you know. I mean Christ, if you if you look at it, if you if if you ask me right now, are Kerry in a position to win the All Ireland right now, I'd say probably not. But I would say that you can't discount against them because of the forward line they have. And you look at it yesterday, and I know we're not going to be talking about it, but a lot of the issues that were highlighted about Mayo yesterday was that they didn't have the killer instinct up front. And I would still have a doubt about Mayo in that regard. It's something that they have not answered on the big stage is can they really put a team to the sword when they need it from their attacking line? Okay, they've always depended on on players out the out back mm. now i would question you talk about you talk about Derry and the attacking play and the pace they come from their back especially their half back line you take david clifford out and david clifford was absolutely my young fella always describes him just as a beast he's a beast in all all form like he he's outstanding every single time cork were getting on top came up the field and he answered. He answered every single time, no matter who's around him. I mean, in a, in a, in a time, Mikey, where you could arguably say defences have never been as bunched, never been as organised, never been as as uh, robbing time off a, a forward and taking that space off. Him. And yet, this fellow's been described as one, one of the greatest of all time. Imagine if he was playing... Imagine he was playing back in our day where he'd destroy us. He'd destroy us where there was actual space back there. But um no, I don't think Kerry are are in a in a in a great, great place, but you still can't count against them because of the fact of the two Clifford, Shawnee Shea, Gainey up front. If they can get that middle third, Jack Barry, uh Dermot O'Connor, you know, Paul Murphy, Gavin White, if they can get them pouring Tom Sullivan um and a little bit more solid defensively. They'll have to be there, thereabouts. But there's a lot of questions to be answered by Kerry yet, in 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 my opinion. Yeah, Niall, you mentioned it earlier, kind of Derry's reliance on Shane McGuigan, which in one way is like, if you have a forward that good, you should be relying on him. David Clifford is 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 better than Shane McGuigan. Yes. Um, people may, some people up, up north may argue with me there, but David Clifford is, as Tomas says, one of the one of the best forwards we've seen. Um, but he's not carrying the t- like he's carrying it in a lot of respects. But from a spread of scoring, he's not because Sean O'Shea, Spillane, uh, Paddy Clifford, um, you know, they're, they're contributing not as much as Clifford, but they are contributing. So it isn't. It's great to have one guy who you know is your go-to, as Tomas says, who can counterpunch when you need a counterpunch. 
But if, if, the important thing for Jack O'Connor is he isn't the only man up front for them, which helps him as well because, you know, the others do need a bit of marking. Yeah. yeah. I'll just say McGuigan's a better hurler than Clifford, but I'll give Clifford. <laughs> uh, no, listen. Are you sure, Niall? <laughs> <laughs> the thing about Clifford is, you know, we all know how good he is. He's so robust as well. Like, uh, you know, the physical abuse he takes, even I, I remember watching the Armagh League match there during the year and he was just taking hits left, right and centre and he's so robust and so capable of taking abuse for 70 minutes and still just pulling these scores out of the fire. Like, it, even the scores there the weekend, just watching the highlights there the weekend, like, they were unbelievable scores. Like, and it's just for Clifford, you're sort of like, right, well, that's that's normal, like some of the points he is putting over. But if other players were scoring them, you'd be... You'd be applauding at just how good they are. Like it, it's, you're almost taking it for granted now that he's going to hit three wonder scores a game, and uh, you know that's a good point about the lack of space there. Like you know, if he was playing twenty years ago, just you know, would he be any better? I don't know because no one's worked out how to stop him. Like even with these extra men on top of him and boys battering off him every two seconds. So I I think we're looking at one of the great players. Like and it's a joy to watch him. And Francis Bell, you know to put manners on him, no. Huh? Francie Bellio wouldn't have put manners on him. No? He, he, unfortunately not. No, no, he, this boy's too good. And uh, Kerry will always be in the All Ireland conversation as long as David Clifford's playing. Like you know, his performance against Throne uh, in twenty twenty one. Like I think he scored six points from play before he had to go off injured. Like and that's that's probably why Kerry didn't win that match. The fact that he had to go off injured for extra time or whatever it was. He's he's just a magnificent player. And as long as he's about. Yeah, there's question marks over Kerry, but it's always going to come back. Clifford's there, so they'll be there, thereabouts. Is is the is the group stage is now almost in the Kerry mindset, Tomas? Is it kind of like an extension of the Munster Championship? Is it like a tu- a tune up service? A chance, you know, nobody expects you. Is anybody in Kerry expecting to see the best Kerry before an All Ireland quarter final? I'm not sure, Mikey, because I don't think I think Jack Connor is cute enough. Jack Connor would have liked to have finished top of that group. Be, mm. uh, purely on the basis that it would he would have given him an opportunity to rest players for a week, like. But it's interesting, like right now, if you look at um, a lot of the teams that will get towards the end, if you look at the Galways, whatever it is, the Mayo's, you have to have threats coming from everywhere. And you know, it is interesting enough. I, you know, you hear stuff on the grapevine, and um, you know, I think the the mantra from Mayo coming. To Killarney and you uh, you can take it whatever way you like but their attitude was and I heard this that that you stopped Tom Sullivan you stopped Gavin White they didn't really worry about the Kerry midfield and they ran right uh, in Killarney Ruan ran right in Killarney um, Shawnee Shea stopped Shawnee Shea and I think all all um, I think they had kind of acknowledged that Clifford was going to do damage but it's how much damage he is going to do damage in every game, but how much damage is he going to do? You do your best with him, but you take out the other strengths that Kerry have, and that's what Kerry, I suppose, have to focus in on. Um, it's 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 getting better by every game, but as we all know, and as we said last night, Mike, it's from here on in that the fun will start, and it's here on in. It's when the, the knockout stages come in that the real pressure will be there. So is there a major, major pressure on Kerry right now? No. But I mean, you look if even if you look at, at Cork yesterday, Mikey, or, or on Saturday, Cork's Matty Taylor and Luke Fahey. I thought Luke Fahey was excellent. It, 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 he just added pace to it, and pace mm. unsettles defences. It, it like where it, it depends what game you're in. If you're in defence, if you were above an old man Saturday night, you had plenty of time to get your defence organised because there wasn't too much of a, a rush by either team to get up the far side of the. Of the of the field, I was looking at Monaghan and Clare, and both teams had it in their psyche. When you get that ball, we're going forward. That's it. Cork had it in their psyche. They were direct, and they actually just drove at Kerry at every opportunity. So it didn't matter if it was Maguire, if it was Fahey, if it was Taylor, Mahoney, they were driving out straight with the ball, and it causes problems. If you don't get that slowdown, if you don't get that press up, um, you're going to be caught at the back. Um, so if are Kerry worried I'd say Kerry would have wanted to have come out on top and do as well as they can um, plus, you know you're always going to make the quarterfinals there's no doubt about that but there's still question marks there at the moment um, and it is Dublin I, I don't know who does favourites in terms of the All-Ireland but right now Dublin 1 Kerry 2 Galway 3 
that's your right. I'd agree with that. But mm. um, look, I think I think you'd have to give it to <clears> Kerry <throat> that they'll always have a chance purely on the fact that the forward line that they'll have, and they do have a little bit of time, a little little bit of time to really get to. We don't know where they're at, Mikey. We don't know yeah. where Kerry are at. We don't know where Dublin are at in reality because with all this shadow boxing, with all this. Are they going to be there? It's it's not. I do think that right now, Kerry and Dublin are probably there to be taken. Um, but if they do get over a big game, it could it could turn their season. Yeah, the the game, Niall, I suppose, certainly from Cork point of view, turned on the the, the penalty and the black card. Um, Sean Powder penalised for pulling down Paul Gini outside the large rectangle, but crucially inside the twenty one and David Goff. Uh, deemed it to be a goal scoring opportunity denied so that's that's the rule penalty black card for the uh, for, for the tackler what, what was your view of it now uh i don't like it again i like he, he's right he's right again and we know that he's willing to do things by the book as we saw up in the athletic <laughs> he's willing to apply the rules of the game yeah <laughs> you know, the t- four red cards for the throne players like uh up in the league match like that was him going by the book and everyone's like, that's really unusual. But then a week later, the same thing happens in a different match and it doesn't happen. And I know if this powder incident happens, see it in the final round, uh, another referee won't give that uh, decision. So by letter of the law, fine. Uh, I just don't like the inconsistency of it. Um, we'll probably not see that happen again for the rest of the summer. I'd be very surprised, uh, to be honest with you. And that's a, like when he sent off the four throne players, were like, right, okay, are we going to see referees really crack down on contributing to Molina? Is that the sort of the benchmark and set? And it just wasn't. It just wasn't. So it's I, I again, I, I I don't disagree with his uh, interpretation. I just don't like the fact that we know how inevitable it is now that we're going to see a similar incident happen and a completely different punishment. And it was a key moment of the game. Um, Cork yeah. were playing well. I, I I watched the Cork Loud match and I was really impressed with Cork. They had a, a wild 10 minutes where they were to let Loud uh, back in it, but they were so dominant up there in Nav and, and a really good performance there at the weekend. So it, it, it was a big moment. Like, you know, the, it was a bit like the Cork Dublin League match where, you know, they had them sort of, you know, uh, pushed back well and, and could have won the match, but just couldn't get the job done. But yeah, I'd be very sore if that decision went against Armagh, to be fair. Yeah, to, Tomas, it's not it makes a fair point. There's a rule there, and it's the same. It's the same in hurling. Like this, this rule kind of originated in hurling, and it was used once, probably badly, uh, um, uh, against Clare, and it kind of referees were scared off using it again. It's frustrating. It's a rule that should be, in, you know, encouraging attacking play, etc. And when we see it, we're like, oh Jesus, that's unusual. I'm not sure about that. But as Niall says, it was by the letter of the law, it was right. It's just because you don't see it often enough, it's hard to take. And you can see why Corker, you know, pissed off about it. Oh, geez, I, I couldn't. I actually couldn't believe it myself, Mikey, when I saw it. I was actually traveling while it was happening. I was listening to it on the radio. I watched the match yesterday morning early. And as a Cork um, person, you would say, geez, it was even if you're okay, if you take in like Powder is a type of player you saw him. Um, in the first half, he rushed in. He just flies into challenges. He yeah. rushed into Shane Ryan in the first half. Uh, he just throws everything at it. It was a small bit of a rash challenge. You could actually argue, Mikey, was it intentional? Because the black card has to be intentional, all that. And they got their black card. They got the 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 foul. We didn't know was it, it was a penalty at this stage. And you say, geez, that's fair punishment. And then the penalty. I think when it came in, every week we were looking for... Jeez, was that a scoring chance? Was it a free? Was that inside the 21? Was it what? Then there was nothing, absolutely nothing. I don't know how many calls were made on this. And then out of the blue, months later, there's a huge call made. Now, I know Clifford was on the far side, but there was a Cork player. He still had to execute that hand pass across. The way things were at the time, it would have had to be a, a kind of a hanging hand pass, which would give Cork players time to get over under it. So was it 100% a goal chance? I'd even argue that. I think Cork argued that afterwards. But technically, I suppose, and Niall mentioned it, yeah, and we all said, yeah, technically he's right. Within the rules, you have to say very strictly. But the problem is, and the problem with refing in general, is there's inconsistency there. And next week, 
So you, I guarantee you, you'll have pundits saying, look at this, this was happened last week. No, it's after putting it back in the spotlight. I think there'll be a lot more pressure on refs now. Um, I do think um, that it was a very harsh call on Cork, letter of the law, yes, but extremely harsh. And it was a turning point. I think Cork were doing very well at the time. And yeah. I think it was the turning of the game, I think it was the winning of the game. Um, and I think going down the straight, when they had introduced Sherlock, uh, Sherlock played without fear. He went at Kerry, and they had a, a, a slight goal chance themselves up the far side. Mikey, you could argue that that game had many twists and turns to go. I think it was a soccer punch to Cork on so many levels. You had the black cards, you had the penalty, you had Clifford stroking at home, and it took the wind out of Cork sails. So it was a massive decision and a strange one given that you probably comb back games and you go <laughs> through what has been played in league and championship so far and you probably could get two or three definites just the same even in the Dublin game above uh, Paul Finn cut a, 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 a fighting Dublin's cause yeah or whatever but um, yeah I think it was very hard but you know why that one wasn't given Niall Scully's one wasn't given because Sean Hurst knows if Niall Scully had got through on goal he was just going to fist the ball over the bar so it wasn't a goal scoring <laughs> chance <laughs> <laughs> There's no way he was shooting for goals, so that's why that one wasn't given. Um, all right, lads, we'll finish up now in a minute. I guess I, I just I we oh, I promised you we'd come back to it, Niall. So we won't we won't we won't we we won't deny you the chance to rake over the coals of Armagh and um, Tyrone. Um, you know there was a lot of water boutery on social media, which is obviously the main reason social media exists. And oh Jesus, people giving out about Armagh's discipline when Tyrone are the filthiest team. Yada 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 yada. You know. There was there was there was three full on Malays in the GA last year. They all involved Armagh, and there's no excusing what Reid O'Neill did. That might be stuff that maybe you might have got away with in Tomas's day, but probably not. But maybe back, you know, the nineties, the eighties, you know, I think in back to Mead Court games, etc. That kind of stuff went on regularly. But if you get seen kneeling on someone's head now for you know a matter of seconds, you're gonna see red. And fair play to the linesman is all I could say because it wasn't easy to see. That was a that was a mess of bodies at that time. I yeah, think it's such a certain in. red that they probably won't even appeal it, which is, <laughs> you know. Uh, I actually, at Armagh, listen, the discipline thing's been something that's hanging over them for a while. I actually think this year they've been, they've tidied up their tackling a wee bit. Um, they've been a bit more disciplined. And McGinney's been whipping off a lot of boys who've been on a yellow card uh, very early doors. So I think there has been steps to try and eradicate some of that sort of loose tackling that they would have been famed for. Um, listen, silly red, silly red, and uh, it's less than 45 minutes or whatever it was, in, or 55 minutes they had to play, and that sort of heat up in Oma, you know, the conditions, uh, 25 odd degrees or something, they could probably sort of just adds to the, the losing the player, just adds a wee bit in that sort of conditions. Uh, They've done okay. They could have probably stole a stole a draw if, if we Connolly had a converted that. And he's a very good soccer player, actually. So that was first class defending from McKernan, to be fair. Um, mm. but it's it's a year ago today since Arma beat Throne in the qualifiers. Um, and that came the week after they beat Donegal up in Clonus, and there was a real buzz and a real excitement about it. And there's just a sort of sense of ennui almost about the team at the moment. And <sighs> Like we talked about earlier about uh, you know how teams are going to start trying to counter Derry. Like so, I don't think you know. I think part of it is the teams have sort of they're not letting Arma. Everyone's like Arma, why are they not kicking it like they did last year? It's like do you think teams are going to let them kick it like they did last year? Do you think teams aren't looking at Arma last year and seeing is there ways we can prevent what Arma were doing last year? The long kicking. But at the same time, they're just there's just a passiveness there, especially when defending their own goal that really needs to be shaken a wee bit uh, if they are going to have impact in this championship. And fair play to own, like uh, McCurry and Cabinet when they're on fire are just a they're a really good pair to watch. Uh, they're two diminutive players, but they're just they're just excellent to watch and really enjoyable to watch. And you know, Tomas talking about teams having a spread of scores, like again, Throne are able to do that at the moment. Um, I think the other night they had a great spread again and boys like McKernan coming up from the back, Hamsey comes off from the back Matty Donnelly sort of found a, a new lease of life this year Petey Hart obviously can come forward I was very unlucky with a goal chance uh, Ronan McNamee can pull off a score here and there, the two midfielders can score they've got a great spread of scores thrown 
and um, and all of a sudden and there's so many question marks over every team and for me there's not an outstanding team in the championship this year so if I had to throw man I'd be a bit like Monaghan you know they're a better team than Monaghan obviously but I'd just be loving where I'm at at the moment just sort of going that wee bit under the radar just finding a wee bit of form and I made the point last week I didn't think they were actually that bad against Galway I think the red card a bit like what happened there on Saturday night, the red card just sort of paused and given Galway a, a real rattle. So Troner, Troner floating along nicely. Yeah, um, I do think two weeks in a row. Um, sorry, yeah, no, go on, go to boss. I, I tell you, the, the I was actually up at that match in on it was, the heat. There was excruciating. I was inside in a tiny box with Marty Morrissey, and it was steamy enough in there. To be fair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but out on the pitch, I I, I find the, the Armagh thing fascinating enough. I think McGinney, they played a kind of a swashbuckling attacking game last year. And I would think the way McGinney is and the way he thinks as a coach, he wants to bring him to the next level. And if he reviews his season last year, the difference between Armagh and that attacking game and they can hurt every team was they were conceding too much at the back. So I can understand why. I don't think he's trying to take the kicking game out of Armagh. But one thing, I suppose, there's a, a, a few things, I suppose, that I would look at. I saw a player sitting and I, you'd look at the kickouts. You either press on the kickouts or you sit off the kickouts. You give the opposition a kickout. If you give the opposition a kickout, your game plan has to be to contain to sit back and try to get turnovers and hit him on the counter-attack. Clare did it in the first half. They didn't do it in the second half. They pushed up a man in the second half and it paid dividends. Possibly they were right in thinking that they couldn't do it for a full match. Armagh, from the get-go, and this is where you have to gauge before a team, are you so afraid of a team with their attacking potency that you're not going to push up? That's the only reason you probably wouldn't really push up, that you'd give them the kick-out. From the get-go, Armagh were giving uh, to roll in the kick out and when in that second half a man down and they started pushing up there was a bite this crowd had got behind them and they got a few turnovers they got a few scores out of it and in my head I'm just saying and it's not that we're saying to Medini that geez you're you're you're, you're gone completely defensive the spark has gone out of the year now you're playing in a, in a containment type, type of a way no but I do think that you look at Toronto, Toronto aren't, aren't in a, at a level where you'd fear them right now. I don't think they're playing with the confidence that you would associate with the Toronto teams of past, right? They were there. I, I felt that Armagh should have pushed up fully and gone full after Toronto the way they can. And when Armagh switched in and, and, and zoned in, it's just that they had a plan in the first half. And when I saw McGee, I thought McGee's interview afterwards was very interesting. I thought he came out and he said, and yes, he was kind of right because I think the question was posed to him, why did you step off? And it looked like you were kind of passive. And he said, we still had four goal chances. Yeah. And had they taken two of those goal chances, you'd have to argue, Christ, yeah, they had their tactics right. They turned mm -hmm. them over, they hit them on the counter, they rattled them with two goals, and then possibly you could, you could afford to go after them that little bit more or sit back and, and allow them on top of you. But I think it kind of backfired on Arma at the weekend. And I think, um, you see, Arma are the type of team and that group is going to be interesting. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if the two Northern teams won that last round of games. Um, to, uh, there's something about, you know, the way up in the North, I've, I've been fascinated by some teams fear other teams. Uh, I think if Armagh went down and played a Kerry and played a Dublin would be different. I don't think they'll, they'll, they'll have that nervousness with them against Galway, even though Galway are probably going better than, than most teams. Unfinished teams. business as well, uh, of course. Yeah, but I, I, I really do think, and I, 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 I think Tyrone will have to look as well, Mikey. They, they, could have, they should have freaking put the, the, the foot on the, net, on the throat when they had it and when they had the opportunity to go at, um, to take... Uh, Arma out of it. They did. They, they when Rian O'Neill left the pitch, they couldn't. They couldn't kick on. They couldn't use that extra man. They couldn't dominate. And even at the last thing, Niall Morgan. If Niall Morgan, if that ball went in, oh my God, it would have been an absolute disaster for Tron. But um, yeah, it was the last. It was one of these games where we've seen the first 45, 50 minutes was poor stuff, and then there was a bit of excitement at the end where you saw teams actually going for it. It was yeah. one of those games. I fine, know. fine, fine margins. Um, okay, let's leave it out. Like, um, I think you now just before we leave, we're going to do some predictions. Now, on a Monday, we don't usually do predictions, but 
the neutral venues for these final round of games are going to be announced um, tomorrow. I'm very curious. So here we go. So let's all have a stab at this. Niall, you can go first. Mayo Cork. Mayo Cork. Are we ruling out Croker? Uh, that could be one for Crook Park, the Mayo crowd. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go Crook Park. Tomas? I will go for, I think Mayo will want uh, an improvement before they go into the quarterfinal. I think they'll no, want no. Where's it going to be played? I don't want to know who's going to win. Oh, Where's sorry, it going to be sorry, played? Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Where will it be played? Limerick. Yeah. Right, huh? Limerick. Uh, I think Limerick too, yeah. Uh, Kerry and Loud then, Tomas, where are they going to go with that one? Thurless. You think Thurless? Uh, I'll say I'll say Port Leash. How about you, Niall? I'm going to go Navin. Oh, oh that's, that'd be very kind to Loud, oh, That's it? very unfair, I mean, Niall. Turl- you couldn't tell you it's not that far. Don't go off the Thurless is a fair spin. Anything, <laughs> anything that beyond the pale is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Tyrone Westmead, Tomas. Tyrone Westmead. Um, trying to think of my geography here quickly. Would yeah, Longford be would King, Longford... King's Kingspan? I would have thought, might maybe. Yeah, possibly Kingspan. Yeah, I, um, I don't know really. I, I, I would say yeah, Kingspan would be good. Yeah. Would you say Breffney Park now, or would you think? Yeah, somewhere I think else? we're going to see a Breffney double header. So I'll go with Breffney for that. Oh, one. with with Galway Armagh, is it? Galway Armagh. Yeah, uh, yeah, that 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 makes sense to us. Does it throw throw the four of them yeah. into into Breffney? Right, Ross Common killed there. Where do you think, Niall? Ross Common Kildare. Would it be Tullamore? They bring it to Tullamore. They could do, yeah, Tullamore. Yeah, yeah, that could make sense. I'll, I'll bear it to Mass's knowledge there, yeah. Okay. I'll go with Longford. That is a bit of a, a as a left field one. Uh, Dublin Sligo. This this is really the reason we're doing this, Tomas. Yeah. Where's Dublin Sligo going to be played? <laughs> Parnell Park, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um... Dublin Sligo, geez, that's a that's an interesting one. Um, ooh, would they bring it to Mullingar? I don't know. Yeah, you wouldn't know where Mullingar put... possibly. Would you go further north? I think it's going to be an issue for them lads. Uh, some of the games, I think, with the fact that 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 um, I think they might have a couple of double headers where they can. I think that the Galway games. That could be another possibly. possibly what other options have you? I don't know. Uh, in a skill? <laughs> Possibly, yeah. That could, be, that could be one for Brathney again, maybe. Dublin Slayer. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. We'll watch with interest. Let's hope it's not in Crow Park. Monaghan, Donegal, uh, Healy Park? Healy Park, yeah. Healy Park, don't even yeah. have to wait for a confirmation. Of Nobody will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> and then Derry and Clare, the dead rubber. This, this one really probably should be played closer to Derry than Clare, you think, but... Derry Slip, Clare. Slip a coin. Slip a coin. Hold advantage. She's getting to Derry. That's an awful. I don't know. Would, you, would they go to Dublin? Uh, they could, yeah, yeah. There's probably going to be a Croke Park double header in there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there, will be, there will be. That's, that's the, there will be a Croke Park double header, you'd imagine. So. Yeah. That could be one for that. This is it, lads. This is the future of predictions, but of venues, not results. Um, Tomas, thank you very much. Niall, thank you much. Uh, very much. Um, one of my court colleagues will be back on Thursday and they'll be previewing the weekend. It was a nice to return for a one-off to these two fine gentlemen. Uh, so they'll be back on Thursday and they'll chat to you then. Good luck. Goodbye. Thank you. Oh, yeah.